I got my PhD in the field of organic chemistry, postdoc at Stanford University. Joined the group of a man who was going to win a Nobel Prize in chemistry. Voted one of the top 50 most influential minds in the world. I was a visiting scholar at Harvard University. I've spoken at every major university in this country. Have over 650 research publications. Voted the R&D Magazine Scientist of the Year. I'm in the National Academy of Inventors. I'm a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Over 120 patents. Started seven or eight companies. We work in areas that range from medicine to material science to electronics, computer memory, medical devices. We work across a broad range of areas. But more than any of that, what means the most to me is that I'm a Jew who believes that Jesus is the Messiah. I grew up just outside of New York City. I thought everybody was Jewish. I didn't even know that there was anything else. I had no particular interest in that, other than when all my friends were getting bar mitzvahed or bat mitzvahed, and then I would attend, of course, every week. There was never really any excitement for me. I remember once I even tried to talk to a, a rabbi. He just brushed me off. There was very little explanation for me. I remember uh, when I went to college, I started meeting a number of people that said that they were born-again Christians, which was sort of an odd term. I was, what's born again? What do you mean, born again? One person saw me in the laundry room. He said, do you mind if I give you an illustration of the gospel? And I remember we sat there and he actually started to draw a picture a cliff with a, with a man on one side, and he drew a little man, and then another cliff with God on the other side, and a big chasm in between that he labeled with sin. And I looked at him, I said, I'm not a sinner. I've never killed anyone. I never robbed a bank. How could I be a sinner? And he had me read a verse from the Bible, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In modern Judaism, we never really talked about sin. I don't remember ever talking about sin in my home. So he turned to another passage. Jesus said, I say to you that everyone who looks upon a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Pow! I felt just as if I had been punched right in the chest. Here I was, new in college. I didn't think anybody knew. I would pick up these magazines and I became addicted to pornography. It was just through those magazines. And all of a sudden, something that's written in the Bible, somebody from live, who lived 2,000 years ago is calling me out on it. And I felt immediately convicted and that now I realized I was a sinner. When I read in the scriptures, what sin is, then I knew I was a sinner. How am I going to get to God? We Jews know this better than anyone else. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. This description in Isaiah 53 of how he will bear upon himself my sin, the things that I had done, and this was him, this was the man that took this upon himself on the cross. The perfect God comes and gives himself for us. He is the one that gives himself for us. I started to realize how Jewish the New Testament is. This book is so Jewish. The New Testament is so Jewish. It's all around Jewish people. And then on November 7th, 1977, I was all alone in my room. The realization that Yeshua is the one who died on the cross. And I said, Lord, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my life. And then all of a sudden, someone was in my room. And I opened my eyes. I was on my knees. I opened my eyes. Who was in my room? That man, Jesus Christ, stood in my room. This amazing sense of God. Jesus was in my room and I wasn't scared. All I started doing was just weeping. The 
presence was so glorious because he was there in my room on that day. And I didn't want to get up. And this amazing sense of forgiveness just started to come upon me. That was him. Finally, I got up. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to tell. Here's this Jewish kid from New York City. What am I going to say? My cousins were shocked. How could you do that? You're Jewish. Telling my mother how I had invited Jesus into my life. She didn't say much. She was weeping. She told my father they weren't happy at all. And she said, I don't blame them for killing Jesus after the things that he said. Who is he to come against these religious leaders that have dedicated their lives to helping people and to tell them that they are whitewashed tombs? Who is he, this young man in his 30s, to say this to these scholars? He got what he deserved. And my mother's a very deep, pensive, careful reader. She read from Genesis right on through the Tanakh, the whole thing, when she got done. I said, what did you think? She said, God warned us over and over again. He warned us. When my daughter was about 15, my mother and father came to visit us. At one point, my mother went into her room for several hours. She came out. She said, what a young girl you have. She talked to me for a long time. She started reading the Bible again, both the Old and the New Testament. One day, not long after that, she called me on the phone at the age of 72. She said, Jimmy, you wouldn't believe what happened. I said, what happened? She said, I was just reading. And it hit me. It hit me. The way he gave his life. I believe it now. Jesus is the Son of God. Welcome to part four with Howard Storm. This is the last part in the series where we're going to be discussing Howard's near-death experience and different insights from it. Welcome back. Thanks again, Howard, for coming on the show. Thanks for inviting me. We're real glad to have you. So can you catch the viewers up in case they missed the first uh, three parts on your near-death experience from the 1980s? Well, I am one of millions of Americans and millions more throughout the whole world who have had a near-death experience, which is a term coined by Dr. Raymond Moody when he published the book Life After Life, and he was the one that popularized the idea. Um, the reason why he chose the term near-death experience was since um, the people that come back from these experiences are alive, he didn't want to get into the argument, how could they have actually been dead if now they're sitting here talking about it? Um, if you talk to the people that have had the near-death experience and also talk um, oftentimes to the people that were around them, the medical people, that they in fact did die and they were really deep in the dying process. So that's what I experienced on June 1st, 1985. I experienced what I believe was dying and um, then because I was an atheist, I was taken into a hellish experience which was um, very horrible and real and in that um, out of desperation, I prayed out to Jesus, whom I had renounced and turned away from as a teenager. And now, you know. Um, but you, you didn't even know who Jesus was, really. You no, had no relationship with him. No, zero. And you didn't know what else to do, and you called yeah, him. Yeah. And he came there and took me out of that place, and we had a life review, and he had, um, answered all my questions. And then um, he sent me back to redo um, my life because what I didn't know was that God uh, wants us to care for each other, and I was only caring for myself, which is a huge mistake. So now you're living completely differently, and, and you said you didn't want to come back to this world because of right. all the pain and suffering yeah. as well. Okay. And then when you came back shortly after, you broke up or split up with your then wife, who didn't accept your, or couldn't understand your experience, couldn't relate to it. Right and because you're a completely different person. Yeah. And now here we are. <laughs> so can, can you talk more to um, near-death experiences, just the phenomena, like before 1975, I think Raymond Moody had his experience and he kind of brought that to be known in the world. But what about prior to that? Were there any near-death experiences? Yes, there were um, 
many of them. Matter of fact, um, a professor at Smith College, Dr. Carol Zaliski, has written about near-death experiences in medieval culture, and there used to be men primarily who went around as itinerant preachers talking about their near-death experience, and she's documented those. But um, they, they've been happening throughout, matter of fact, in, throughout history. In, in the book of Timaeus written by Plato, there's a near-death experience. Uh, one of my favorite is the near-death experience of St. Paul and uh, his letter to the Corinthians. He talks about his own near-death experience when he was stoned to death in Athens um, 16 years earlier when he wrote it. And so they, they've been around, but um, because of that book and then um, subsequent to that book, there have been hundreds and even thousands of books written about near-death experience. And there's a lot of people who have not had near-death experience that are doing research on them. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that they find... Um, similarities and some dissimilarities throughout the world. So I would um, suggest that near-death experiences are all a little bit idiosyncratic to that person, mm -hmm. and they don't all have to be the same. They, in fact, they aren't all the same. Mm -hmm. And as people have studied near-death experiences in other cultures, like, for example, in India and other places that people have researched, um, remarkable similarities mm -hmm. to the experiences of uh, Americans and Western Europeans. They seem to be um, have stronger similarities than dissimilarities so, throughout the world. So, for example, the life review, and, and you are your own judge when you when you die, is that right? And you, you review well, your life? You you are your own judge, but that is aided by the um, feelings oh. of the people that you are um, associated with that at that time. In other words, um, Jesus and the angels expressed their feelings about what they saw in my life review. And did you feel the other person's pain? Like um, there are times in our oh, life yeah. when we hurt other people yeah. intentionally or unintentionally. And when you die, you feel their pain and you have to reconcile that within yes. yourself. Now that's that's what I read in all the near-death stories yeah. that I've come across. And, I, I, had felt, that, and um, I felt Jesus's pain You feel seeing that. me ignore other people's pain. <laughs> Wow. So that's a, I guess that's really impetus to change. Yeah. Like when you came back, you said you made a complete change, maybe yeah. based on that pain. Yeah. So those are some of the similarities. Um, now, why do you think we're having so many near-death experiences? I mean, they're popping up like crazy now. You go to the bookstore and, you know, there's a new book almost every week on yeah. a different person from a different part of the world yeah. that had a near-death experience. Why yeah. is God doing this? Um, I really believe that we are living at um, a real crossroads in human history. Mm -hmm. And Jesus told me that, and um, to put it um, simply, I think that there's a great awakening going on. And it's not just near-death experiences. That's, that's one factor in trying to wake up people in this materialistic culture to the fact that this phenomenon needs to be addressed and dealt with and taken seriously. Um, but there's throughout the whole world and in the United States, um, a great awakening of all kinds of um, what might be categorized as mystical experiences. By mystical experiences, I'm not necessarily talking about just a Tibetan hermit, you know, um, <laughs> living in a cave in the Himalayas, because I believe that everybody is having um, experiences. And when you talk to people and when they come to trust you, they begin to relate their experiences. Uh, for example, um, at the first church I served as full-time pastor, a woman came up to me and told me about her um, mystical experience that happened to her in church. And I said, who else did you tell? And she said, well, I never told anyone but you because um, I thought they would make fun of me. But since um, I know that you've had these experiences, um, mm -hmm. I figured you wouldn't make fun of me. So that there's a, a huge trust level because um, I got... I went into a period of silence for a while because I got so uh, frustrated with people ridiculing me for talking about this stuff. I mean, in public really, or friends, family, everybody. Oh yeah, family, friends, yeah. everybody. So they didn't believe in your story. No, nobody did. Because see, that that's the thing. God, God chooses you. You didn't choose to have this experience. So God chooses certain people to come and spread. I guess spread whatever message He wants them to spread. I mm -hmm. don't know what you know what you wrote about, what you spoke about. Yeah. And you, like you said, your experience was unique to you, and their experiences are unique to them yeah. for their part of the world. And you're here to tell what this, what the society that you're a part of really needs to hear. So I, I personally believe that we should 
listen to the message because it came from God. Yeah, you didn't, I, bl- you didn't I, choose I believe it. so. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so now um, you said that's one major reason or one major way God is trying to reach people. What what other way is He trying to reach people? There's um, an interesting um, revolution going on in the world of the church. You know, in um, the developed world, meaning primarily Western Europe and the United States, um, churches are dying left and right, and church attendance is declining. But there's um, counter movements taking place. There's this new kind of churches um, happening all over the country. And what's that? Um, churches where the worship is more engaging and more lively and using more contemporary music. And uh, those, a lot of those churches are mega churches and they have a huge emphasis on uh, groups, small groups. Um, mm-hmm. you know, when you become part of the church, it's not just that uh, seeker-friendly service that they have. It also is they encourage you to become engaged to the church through, um, you know, um, mission activity or Bible study. Community or, building, you know, maybe. Community, yeah. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the church is becoming um, redefined in new ways. Just like um, everything in our society, like the publishing industry is changing. Um, every, every industry in our society um, is reinventing itself in order to adapt to this new world. And God wants a new world, you mentioned in the other series, just on compassion. He wants a world that's filled with compassion and where we love our neighbor and live together in a community. So do you think this is the foundation that's being set to attain that goal? Yes, and um, the gods of wealth and material success, I think for a lot of people, particularly the young people, are losing their luster. And I don't think um, it's such a powerful call to become rich and powerful anymore that it used to be. Everybody wanted, the Rachel Alger story used to be, be rich and powerful, be the top dog. You know, that's, that was the American dream. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't think a lot of people are buying into that anymore. What are they buying into now? And what do they want? Hopefully they want a meaningful life. People are searching for that yeah. deep spiritual satisfaction, but yeah. do you think a lot of people are searching in the wrong places, or well, what's what's the I guess the division that still exists out there? Well, um, perhaps it's the church's failure, perhaps it's Christianity's failure, and I and I certainly would um, say that it has failed in many ways to be the the source of meaningful life experience. The Christian, for a lot of Christianity people. has failed. It's failed a lot of young people because they're not going. A lot of young people aren't going to church, and when they fill out um, no religion, none. They're the, they're called the nuns, N O N E, because on the form when it says religious religious preference, they put none, mm-hmm. and the millennials are writing none in there because mm-hmm. they have not found what they're looking for in the church. So, shame on the church. And I'm a pastor. I mean, so I'm indicting myself too. I mean, it's not. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but there are places that are reaching them, and mm-hmm. thank God for them. And um, there's the home church movement where um, they don't have buildings, they don't have they don't have paid staff. People are just meeting in small groups in homes and mm-hmm. experiencing church that way. Mm-hmm. So now back to heaven. When when you were in heaven, what was the most impactful thing that you took away? And I'm sure everything was you know profoundly had an impact on you, but what was the main thing that stands out or that has really changed your life? Well, that's actually pretty easy for me to answer. Um, how much Jesus loves me and you and everybody, but I, I didn't know how important I was to Jesus. He, um, you know, he made us. I mean, he, I hope you like your nose because Jesus did that. I hope you like your eyes because Jesus did that. I hope you like the way your mind works because Jesus did that. And he made everybody unique and everybody's special. Everybody's beautiful. Everybody's wonderful to Jesus. And um, he thinks we're just about the most terrific thing in the whole creation, each and every one of us. And um, he wants us to um, blossom in this world. He wants us to uh, produce all the good fruits of God. Um, He wants each one of us to just overflow with love and peace and joy and faith and self-control and compassion. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And when we don't do that, um, it makes them sad because um, we haven't experienced life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what does he, um, I mean, what did he tell you about when, you, when you're coming back to earth? Did he tell you to live in a certain way or was that just understood? He told me to love the person I was with and he told me that um, I could access his love whenever I needed it, mm -hmm. which I do frequently. Um, he told me um, I didn't have to do anything grand for him, just simply love the person that I was with and um, to put my trust and faith in him and to come to rely upon him. Mm -hmm. And during your life review, you got a solid understanding of all the events in your life and the meaning and the purpose of different things that may have been troubling you, like relationships with people. So he, he explained everything to you. Yes, and unfortunately, all the stuff that I thought was everybody else's fault was really um, uh, very much a part of my own misdirection, mm -hmm. you know, in, in those relationships. So we have a lot more power or we should take a lot more control than we think. Yeah, because one of the things Jesus told me, he said that if you look for evil and anger and hatred, you'll find those things, and that'll be your reality. If you look for love and beauty and goodness, you'll find those things, and that'll be your reality. Mm -hmm. So I am not saying we create our own reality. But I'm saying we, we color and influence our own reality, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I know you mentioned um, other worlds. Did he talk to you about there's other worlds in this universe? Yeah, um, he he not only talked about it, he showed me other worlds and told me that God, being the creative um, genius that he is, has created a lot of life throughout the universe. And this is not the only planet with intelligent life. And in fact, this is one of the lowest forms of intelligent life in this world. And there's other planets where it is a Garden of Eden and it's a world of peace and love and goodness. and. Um, he wants this world to develop into a whole new world. Um, and yeah. that's not so far away, hopefully. When you say not so far away, are we talking decades or centuries? Because how we live now. Well, we he not? showed me that in 200 years from 1985, that is, it is going to be a new earth. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to begin within the next 20 or 30 years. New earth. So when the millennial generation is yeah. in their 50s, so I'm laying a hot, lot of hope on the young people. Yeah, but, but they don't, I mean, a lot of them aren't, well, I guess they're spiritual, but a lot of them don't believe in God or the atheists. Are there a lot of atheists in the millennial generation? Or I, don't, I, I don't know. I hope yeah. not. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe the majority of them are already passing away. But yeah, do you see them as a threat to society? As a threat? Yeah, the atheists. Oh, I absolutely, because, um, you know, uh, we have some interesting characters in our recent history who um, were atheists. Uh, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong. Mm -hmm. um, those three individuals were responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of their own people. Mm -hmm. Not counting the tens of millions that they're responsible for in their wars with other people. Mm -hmm. Mao Zedong allowed 35 million of his people die of starvation during the Cultural Revolution. And when he was told by his um, advisors and ministers that um, they were dying by the millions on the countryside because of his uh, attempts to create cooperative family, he said, let them die. I don't care. Let them die. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, the... The problem with atheism, there's no higher authority. It's like what, you know, the, the atheist is like, what I will be done, you know? <laughs> Instead of God, you will be done. Yeah. So there's no accountability. Right. So do you think that leads to a lack of conscience? Absolutely. And it leads mm -hmm. to um, extreme egotism and narcissism. And I think that the biggest danger in our society right now is that uh, narcissism is running rampant in our country. And you want, God wants self love. To fabric um, to build together societies and communities yeah. opposite yeah. of what God wants. Yes. Now, do you think this is the work of the enemy? Um, well, what did you learn about the, you know, the, the devil attacking us? Well, um, I asked Jesus, why, why is there evil in the world? He, and he um, spoke to me because I was an artist. He, he spoke to my understanding. And he said, could you paint with one color? And I said, well, not very well. I said, it's the contrast that makes the art. 
that that's the tool of a visual artist is contrast and he said that's why evil exists to contrast this we have no freedom of choice without the ability to choose between right and wrong good and evil so is, is death. free will a blessing or a curse because it can go either way if there was no free will then you wouldn't have the option to choose evil and then maybe we just all choose good and the world would have a different... And we would have no free will, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it ultimately is a blessing, and I believe that's one of the main characteristics that makes us in the image of likeness of God. There's free will, there's the ability to reason, there's imagination, there's creativity. Um, mm -hmm. And one, one of the ones that I feel very strongly about is a sense of aesthetic, a sense of beauty. You know, um, I'm a dog lover. I've had pets all my life, and... Uh, they have no aesthetic sense. They, you know, yeah. <laughs> in what they see, what they smell, what they taste, they just, uh, you know, they, they don't discern, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, when you think about um, music, for example, you could take music from the other side of the world, bring it into a culture, and it can be easily appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see where in the animal kingdom there's any appreciation of those things, maybe on some subliminal level, but it's very interesting how um, music, for example, um, transcends culture, and, yeah. and art does too, because I love um, art from other parts of the world, you know, yeah. from Africa and from um, South Pacific, et cetera, um, not just Western art. I mean, one of the biggest influences on Western art has been um, art from um, other countries like Africa. Right. So that's what God's kind of striving for in the in the emotional, mental sense, to have compassion and like a one one world, united world, just like how we appreciate food and art from other cultures. You're saying to amalgamate everything. But without domination of anybody. Right. Because, you know, when you okay. said one world, I'm all of a sudden thinking about the people that are like, you know, really paranoid about like, you know, the one world, but what they think the UN's trying to take over and we're going to have a one world government. Right. Domination is the great evil. This it is a world evil. without anybody dominating anyone. Everyone's free to live in their communities as they choose. Mm -hmm. So that's another impediment. Yeah. The domination of one government is larger than the other. Yeah, because the, 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 the desire to dominate and control the people is like one of the main manifestations of evil. And like those um, famous character, infamous characters that I just mentioned, Hitler, Stalin, mm -hmm. and Mao Zedong, um, Right. The, their whole point was to control. I am going to control your life right down to, you know, yeah, the yeah. smallest detail. And and back to when you were atheist, did you find that the enemy spoke to you or attempted you or attacked? I shouldn't say attack, but did he influence your, your thinking ever? Now that you look back, maybe you didn't realize it at the time, like to make certain decisions or do certain things or act in certain ways. Oh, absolutely, because I was part of the uh, San Francisco drug, sex, and rock and roll movement. Um, okay. Total distraction from what life is about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I lived in San Francisco from 66 to 72. Okay. Uh, rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's, um, it, it's a distraction from what your, real, your true life purpose is. Yeah. So how do people know what their true life purpose is? You mentioned when, when you came back from heaven, God told you, love the one you're with. Right. So your purpose is to love, and that spreads love, and eventually you win the whole world over one person at a time. So how do people know what, what their life purpose is? Like what, what's, is my life purpose to love people as well? Absolutely, and it, begin, and it begins with our, our family and then our extended family and then mm -hmm. our schoolmates or workmates and extends out. But you... Lo love the people that you're in contact with. And um, what it really means is that person that you're with at that moment, be, do your best to care about them, to be non-judgmental about them, mm -hmm. and to um, appreciate them, have an aesthetic appreciation for them as a person. Okay. I mean, or if I may, see them the way Jesus sees us. And which, you know, and like which means total acceptance, not total trying acceptance, to change them, right. just love them, give them the gift of acceptance. Yeah. For who they are unique yeah. and apart and different from you yeah. and appreciate that okay so my last question is what would you tell people who are scared of death because you've been to heaven you've been you said you've been to to hell as well what would you say if someone's scared of dying or or how, how can you speak to the afterlife one of the interesting things about um, studies of near-death experiences that they've tested people to see if they have 
a fear of death, which is the number one fear of all the people universally throughout the whole world. The number one fear is fear of death. And people that have had a near-death experience um, on these tests flunk the test. They have no fear of death. I have no fear of death because I know that death is a transition from this state of existence into another state of existence. And fear of death comes for two reasons. One is people are afraid to let go because this is what we know, this is what we've experienced, and I don't want to let go of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to let go of cushions and, you know, air conditioning and heating and, you know, Familiar, refrigerators yeah. and, you know, automobiles. I don't want to let go of any of that stuff. I'm very attached to those things. But um, we, we do, when we move on, let go of that stuff, become detached from those things because we find new attachments, which is greater love, greater peace, greater security. And, of course, God, most of all. So the fruits um, of the spirit. Yeah, and the other reason why people are afraid of death is because um, they're not sure if there is a life after death. So I would submit to those people, um, since there's millions of people in this world and they're writing books like crazy and they're being settled like crazy, talking about um, their experience of what it's like to move beyond this world, uh, check it out and see if it's uh, convincing to you because mm -hmm. there's a lot of evidence. So there's proof, I mean, heaven does exist. It definitely exists. That's yeah. what I would say to these people. Yeah, and people say, well, it's just anecdotal. Well, I've been to Finland three times, and it really does exist. Um, <laughs> and so have been a lot of other people. You know, um, very few people in this world will go to Finland because it's not a hot spot for tourism. But trust me, uh, it is, and the Finns are really great people, and they really do speak Finnish. And um, um, yeah. it's, it's a great place. But, you know, so that's anecdotal evidence, right? Right. You can experience God, too. You can experience um, God's love and peace and God's promises of life after death if you want to by asking him. You just need to have a willing heart. Yeah. God wants all of us, obviously. Yeah. And heaven's not as far as we think, is it? No, because the interesting thing is, is that heaven and hell are in other dimensions. They aren't geographical locations. Geographical, right. So um, yeah. it's really just like, step from this dimension into the other dimension and there you are. So it's like thinking about it from a different perspective and it's also time in those places is not linear. Like right. they don't have clock time like we do here. Right, completely different. Time as we know it doesn't exist because it's um, a grander kind of time which is all time. And you can't tell how long you were there when, when you had your experience. Right. You, you just, it but it was a long time. <laughs> did it seem like hours? Yeah. Or I had like, a lot of experience. No, it seemed like years. Oh, it seemed like years. Yeah. But you were gone, I mean, in Earth time, a couple hours? Mm, seconds. Oh, it was seconds. Yeah. Wow. That's definitely some food for thought. Yeah. Well, thank you. Do you have anything else you want to tell viewers before we wrap up? Um, I think the most important thing that I have to say is um, it's very difficult for us to comprehend how much God loves us, but if you want to know, um, seek, seek God and you will experience the love that's going to change your life for the better. Mm -hmm. And God's going to give you the good, good gifts of the Spirit in order to um, use that love in meaningful ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's really good advice. Thank you so much for this four-part series, yeah. Howard. Definitely I'm blessed by all the uh, wisdom I acquired. Thank you.